confrontation in Martinez, California this weekend. A couple of people decided to paint over a Black Lives Matter street mural despite the city sanctioning the mural. The man and woman toting black paint said all lives matter and that police killings are a consequence of resisting arrest. Police are now searching for the couple. The mural was later repainted. Crowds and COVID-19, the growing concerns over large groups of people contributing to a surge in cases. At least nine states are reporting record numbers of infections over the holiday weekend. 20% of the country's new cases are in Florida. The state now forced to close restaurants to indoor seating. Its cases doubling across the state in fewer than two weeks. Hospitalizations in Texas are also at an all-time high. And now Arizona is the latest state to top 100,000 confirmed cases. This is scientists warn the virus may be airborne. President Trump is facing criticism for claiming without evidence that 99% of cases are, quote, totally harmless. This, as he suggests, NASCAR made a mistake by banning the Confederate flag and demands an apology from driver Bubba Wallace after a noose was found in his garage. A disturbing amount of gun violence plaguing America over the weekend. 75 people shot in Chicago, more than a dozen killed, 55 shot in New York. Young children killed in the crossfire as gun sales are on the rise. Uneven ground, the seemingly never-ending barrage of earthquakes being felt in Puerto Rico. The island simply unable to catch a break. And with the issues dividing Americans front and center in our national discourse, it's never been a more appropriate time to ask, what would you do? Our John Quinones tells us what the new season has in store. Good evening and thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo in for Lindsay Davis. We begin today with the uptick in U.S. COVID-19 cases. Nine states are now reporting record hospital hospitalizations, excuse me, across the country. As across the country, we near three million confirmed infections. But scenes from over the weekend show many are not heeding warnings to social distance. These are partiers at Diamond Lake in Michigan packed together. And a similar scene at a pool party in Missouri, the establishment just next to where there had been an outbreak weeks ago. It comes as Dr. Anthony Fauci issues a concerning new assessment. Our Matt Gutman leads us off. Tonight, those throngs slammed together in 4th of July parties across the country, cementing concern, basic messaging like social distancing is not being followed. At this lake in Michigan, hundreds partying shoulder to shoulder and few masks in sight. And this packed concert inside an Atlanta nightclub. And to Nashville and Oakland, those crowds igniting fears the coronavirus is spreading faster and deeper into the country. In just the first six days of July, a quarter of a million new infections nationwide. Dr. Anthony Fauci today not mincing words. The current state is really not good. It's a serious situation that we have to address immediately. In Florida, new cases doubling over the past two weeks. Miami-Dade's mayor reversing course, closing restaurants and gyms. Stephen Cooper, seen here on the far left of this iconic photo, sprinting from the falling Twin Towers, surviving 9-11, only to die from COVID-19 in Florida. Dr. Nema Kabir is only in the second year of his residency, forced to the front lines in a Miami hospital. We have colleagues who were testing positive and have to uh, be quarantined and so you know the rest of us have to pick up the slack. President Trump coming under fire for once again downplaying the virus incorrectly attributing the surge in cases to increased testing. Now we have tested almost 40 million people. By so doing we show cases 99 percent of which are totally harmless. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo today saying the president is enabling the pandemic. What he's really saying is if we didn't test, we wouldn't find the cases. So on that theory, let's do no more cancer tests and that'll solve the problem with cancer. Mr. President, don't be a co-conspirator of COVID. And presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden's campaign saying in a statement the president is outright lying to the nation about the extreme threat of COVID-19. Tonight, the White House defending the president's comments. The president was noting the fact that the vast majority of Americans uh, who contract coronavirus uh, will come out on the other side of this. Nine states hitting new records for hospitalizations this weekend, including Texas. A record number of people hospitalized in Arizona, now one of eight states with more than 100,000 
1,000 cases. We see young people coming into the hospitals and saying nobody told them that they would get sick. Young people do get sick. We've seen young people sick, get sick, and we've seen young people even die. In California, the governor is shutting down indoor dining and bars in San Diego and five other counties and stepping up enforcement on businesses. One doctor warning tonight. And if we all don't get our acts together, then, then there's really no place in the country that's going to be spared. And Matt Gutman joins us now from California. Matt, there are some new numbers out tonight showing how the virus is affecting Americans disproportionately along racial lines. What do we know? We have had anecdotal evidence that African Americans and Latinos have been disproportionately affected, right? The numbers are higher, but there wasn't a tremendous amount of hard data. The New York Times sued the federal government to obtain data that has been gleaned by the CDC. And this is what we now know, that uh, African Americans are three to four times more likely to contract the virus than their white neighbors, and that Latinos and African Americans are much more likely to die from the virus than their white neighbors. We don't know why that is exactly. It could be because uh, they are uh, more essential workers. That part of the survey is not yet known, but what is clear is that what has been anecdotally presenting itself over the past several months is now backed up by hard data. Diane. Yeah, sad truth. Matt Gutman for us from California. Thanks, Matt. Now let's go over to epidemiologist Dr. Eric Feigelding for more on the growing number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations. Doctor, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. So public health officials are warning now that young people without underlying conditions are not immune to this virus. And we were all sadly reminded of that yesterday when 41-year-old Broadway star Nick Cordero passed away after a roughly three-month battle. Are these so-called long-haul cases where people struggle against this virus for a long time becoming increasingly concerning? Yeah, the illness is not as mild as people are I think it is. It is definitely not 99% harmless, as the president or his chief of staff um, have said today. It really has long-term impacts on your metabolic health as well as actually your brain health as well. So I think the fact that so many young people are being affected just balloons the total number of uh, cases that will ultimately harm Americans. And this is why we have to be vigilant, even if you're young. I just want to expand on that a little bit because it seems like when we talk about this virus, it's often in the camp of either you're going to die or you're going to be fine. But it seems like what we don't often hear about is concerns about long-term effects for survivors. Yeah, indeed. There is a lot of evidence that people have long chronic fatigue illnesses. There is some brain and dementia issues among some patients who survived the ICU. And of, of course, there's blood clots. And there's some evidence that actually might cause diabetes. So altogether, there are so many reasons to avoid this. And just because we have hospital beds free is not a reason to keep going out and living a dangerous life. Now, we just learned that Atlanta Mayor uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms tested positive but was asymptomatic. So given in a, how we know about asymptomatic testing, should we be pushing for everyone in the country to get tested? I think we should just still, we're still behind in capacity. Uh, we're still not testing enough people and we're actually falling behind um, because our caseload has been rising so fast. So we're not at that point where we should test everyone um, yet or or at all. I think we should still go with targeted early testing because once you test, you want to isolate them, you want to contact trace them, and then quarantine their contacts. That is the main formula for fighting epidemics because most epidemics in the past have been fought off and won without a vaccine with this classic strategy. But we're neither doing that, nor are we doing, t again, testing enough for the people with symptoms. And asymptomatic is this one problem. It's such a pernicious virus that it will keep popping up and up until we ultimately have masks for all or a vaccine. On that note, 239 scientists penned a letter to the World Health Organization outlining evidence that small virus droplets can remain in the air and infect people. But the WHO says there's not enough evidence to prove the virus is airborne. So 
Where do you fall on this? How do you explain this to the public? And if it does spread through the air, do we need to change our approach? Yeah, absolutely. And 239 um, pretty well regarded scientists, I, I would like to say. And this WHO it always airs a little bit too on the cautious side. They said there was once no human to human transmission. There was, uh, we don't know about masks. But just because we don't know about something for certain does not mean we should ignore it. And right now, these aerosol scientists who study, study airborne particles for living show that these micro droplets can stay in the air for 20 minutes or longer. And this is why it's so important to focus on mask wearing and improving ventilation and, av and avoiding congregated places where people are just spraying their saliva indoors, such as in bars and nightclubs. All right. Good advice. Dr. Feigelding, we appreciate your time as always. Thank you. And now to Washington, where President Trump is downplaying the strength of the virus, as you heard the doctor say, putting out there that 99 percent of cases are totally harmless. That was the quote from President Trump. The president also today called the noose that officials recently found in NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace's garage a hoax, adding that Wallace should apologize. This after several speeches over the holiday weekend, accusing what he called new far left fascists of wanting to wipe out American history. Here's ABC's Chief White House Correspondent, Jonathan Carl. After back-to-back -back speeches this weekend where the president accused his political opponents of trying to destroy America, the president today took aim at NASCAR's only full-time black driver, Bubba Wallace. Has Bubba Wallace apologized to all those great NASCAR drivers and officials who came to his aid, stood by his side, and were willing to sacrifice everything for him, only to find out that the whole thing was just another hoax, the president tweeted? In fact, there was no hoax. A noose operating as a garage pull was found in Wallace's garage. An FBI investigation determined it had been placed there last year, long before Wallace was assigned to that garage. Wallace thanked the FBI for its quick investigation. Why is the president even suggesting that Mr. Wallace should apologize? Well, look, the FBI, as I noted, concluded uh, that this was not a hate crime, uh, and he believes it'd go a long way if um, Bubba came out and acknowledged that as well. The president concluded his tweet on Bubba Wallace by calling out NASCAR's decision to ban the Confederate flag. That and flag decision has caused lowest ratings ever. Does he think it was a mistake for NASCAR to... Bannon. The president said he wasn't making a judgment one way or the other. Well, are you saying that uh, NASCAR's ratings are down because they banned the flag? That's what he said. Uh, the president was noting the fact that in aggregate, this notion that NASCAR men and women uh, who have gone and who are being demeaned and called racist and being accused in, in some venues of committing a hate crime against an individual, uh, those allegations were just dead wrong. NASCAR's ratings are actually up since they banned the Confederate flag last month. Today, in a statement, NASCAR says, quote, it continues to stand tall with Bubba, our competitors and everyone who makes our sport welcoming and inclusive for all racing fans. As for Bubba Wallace, today he called on people to put love over hate, tweeting, even when it's hate from the POTUS, love wins. And John Carl joins me now. John, the president's critics, including Vice President Biden, say that he's stoking these cultural divisions to distract from the administration's handling of the pandemic. How's the White House responding to that? Well, the White House is denying that, but also denying reality. I mean, at one point today, the White House press secretary uh, actually accused reporters of being the ones that were uh, harping on and bringing up the Confederate flag, when obviously this was something the only reason it was being discussed was because of the president's tweet. And the president also said over the weekend that 99 percent of COVID-19 cases are harmless. Is there any evidence to support that claim? Uh, no, there's not. And the White House was pressed on, on this. What they say is that uh, the president was talking about the morbidity rate, the death rate being, you know, something that is coming down. Uh, but obviously, uh, you, there, you, you can die from COVID-19. Uh, you can also uh, suffer greatly uh, and not die. So the idea of, you know, that this basically is harmless unless you're in that uh, small percentage who die from it uh, is, is also something that doesn't comport with reality. All right, John Carl from Washington. Thanks, John. Thanks, Diane. Next to the disturbing rise in gun violence across the country, hundreds shot in New York, Chicago, Philly, Los Angeles, and other major cities. Dozens have been killed, including an eight-year-old in Atlanta. The mayor there saying enough is enough.
Georgia's governor is even declaring a state of emergency, and that's where Steve Osinsami files this report. The numbers of American lives shattered by gunfire over the weekend are alarming. 77 people shot in Chicago. 14 of them died, including this seven-year-old. So many of the dead this weekend are black children. 11-year-old Devon McNeil was hit by a stray bullet on the way to a cookout in Washington, D.C. And in Atlanta, 8-year-old Sequoia Turner was killed by rounds of gunfire shot into a car. <laughs> Birthday. Doing that thing? Atlanta's mayor says the shooters were black and that it happened just outside this Wendy's parking lot where 27 year old Rayshard Brooks was killed a month ago at the hands of a white police officer. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. The burned down restaurant has become a memorial for peaceful protests, but ever since, a group of people with long guns have taken over the area and blocked roads. Police are searching for the child's killer and today finally moved in and took back the street. We're fighting the enemy within when we are shooting each other up on our streets. Police in New York and frankly across the country are arguing that the push for police reforms is making it harder for them to keep people safe no matter their color. They are afraid if they're, if they're making an arrest that if their knee goes on the back of someone that they are fighting their life for, that they could be prosecuted. And we're joined now by Steve Osinsami from Atlanta. Steve, the governor of Georgia declared a state of emergency. What did he say and what happens next? Well, he said that he felt that the peaceful protest that sort of swept through the streets after the George Floyd shooting in, or George Floyd killing in, in Minneapolis and the Rayshard Brooks shooting here in Atlanta, he felt that those peaceful protests were hijacked by criminals. And so what he's done is that he has called up a thousand troops to help local authorities. Now, I will say that part of the reason why he called those troops is because he essentially made a threat last night saying, that if Atlanta police didn't come in and take control of that Wendy's restaurant and that street and that area and that neighborhood that men with guns were, 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 were taking control of, that he would do it for them. And so what he did today was to call up the National Guard to help police maintain law and order in the city. And Steve, the mayor of Atlanta made comparisons to the Wild West. From what you're hearing as you talk to people, do you get a sense that people in the city feel unsafe? Uh, that's a, a really good question. Um, I, I, I would argue as a resident who lives here, who's lived here for a long time and talking with a number of different residents that if you ask people who live in the Buckhead area, they'll say absolutely they don't feel safe. And if you talk to people who live on sort of the south end of town, they'll say the same, just perhaps not as strongly. And, 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 I, and I would also argue that that feeling is shared not just among the city's white residents, but black residents too. Right now there is a great deal of concern about if you call 911 and you call and ask for help from police, will they respond? That That's the, the big question on the minds uh, of people who live in this city right now. And people aren't so sure or certain that police will be responding to the same sort of calls that they were responding to six months ago. Diane. All right, Steve Osinsami from Atlanta. Thanks, Steve. And for more analysis of this surge in gun violence, we bring in Robert Boyce, retired chief of detectives for the NYPD department. Thank you, chief, for joining us. Great to be here, Diane, thank you. So tell me a little bit about, why do you think we're seeing this surge in violent crime right now in these cities? Sure, there's a confluence of, uh, confluence of issues here that we're seeing, but the primary, the driver here is the anti-police mantra. Well, what it's created is a, uh, a end of proactive policing. So it's gonna be all reactive policing. They're going to take different uh, different issues and different initiatives and change them. Right now in New York, where there's no plainclothes officers out there who are enforcing uh, radical street crime. So there's an erosion of morale here. And I can see officers, they'll, they'll respond, they'll come, but they're not going to be in the same fashion they were. So now you see uh, parties, uh, house parties and street fairs really uh, just devolving into violence as the, as the overnight goes. So we're looking at different issues here. But the biggest driver here is the fact that it's the anti-police, and now the, uh, the politicians have embraced the mob, saying defund the police, which is counterintuitive. Uh, now more than ever, you need a very strong, very intelligent-driven police department, and we're not seeing that. We see other things as well. 
in New York and across the country. It's a horrible weekend to see all the slaughter of innocents throughout our nation in these big cities. So it's very disturbing for me being a career law enforcement when I see it, see mothers crying on TV, horrible situations. Uh, but I, you look at other things too, uh, bail reform in New York. You'll see prisons being downsized. There's nothing wrong with criminal justice reform, but it needs to be done intelligently. We're seeing the needle go too far to the left here. Uh, and so we're seeing more and more people on the street. And the mayor said today it was coronavirus, not really other than the fact that coronavirus led more people out of jail, more people on the street, more criminal element that we've seen. Our numbers are going through the roof and it's very, very distressing for us. And Chief, you're talking about seeing more people on the streets. Do you believe that the struggling economy and the virus may be contributing at least in that fashion? In a small way, but it's not It's not uh, in these communities that I've seen. I've worked my entire career in uh, East New York and Brownsville and East Flatbush and South Bronx. Those are communities being, being deluged with this violent street crime. And so it, it is a concern, but I think it's the sense of lawlessness that we see um, across the nation, even here in New York. A disrespect for the police. And you mentioned the defunding the police movement. And this is a large source of conversation throughout the country right now. And while there are some who want to see police abolished entirely. It seems the majority of that movement is really looking for not putting so much responsibility on the police and sharing some of those duties with other experts that may be better equipped to deal, for example, with mental health situations. So when you look at defunding the police through that lens, what is your take on that push? I think one of the big problems we have is uh, a failure of our society to handle uh, the mental illness. And it's now pushed back, back down to the street cop to handle it when someone's in, in dire uh, need in the street, creating uh, those issues, creating violence against himself and others. So the police officers are at the bottom of the line here, and they have to deal with it because we haven't put in measures to help those, those most infected um, with mental illness. We have no problem with social workers coming in and, and addressing it. We want them to be safe as well. Uh, so they have to be well trained. They should be uh, assisted by the police in that fashion. So we, I think most people in law enforcement would, would embrace it with no problems. All right, Chief Boyce, great to talk to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Just under four months from today, Americans will head to the polls to cast their ballots for president. Many will begin mailing in ballots even sooner than that, but it will ultimately be members of the Electoral College in this country who formally decide the winner of the election. And today, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a major decision on the role those electors can play and the power of the states to enforce how they vote. ABC's Devin Dwyer, who covers the court for us, joins me now with an update. Devin, this case involved so-called faithless electors who essentially pick a candidate against the will of the voters in their state. What did the justices have to say about that? Yeah, Diane, they're rare, and they've never impacted the outcome of an election so far. But faithless electors for years have raised the possibility of chaos uh, in our elections, especially to pick the presidency. Imagine intense lobbying to get some to change their vote, potentially even bribery. Well, the Supreme Court said today definitively that states can require their electors to, to vote a certain way. Here's Justice Elena Kagan, who wrote the court's majority opinion. She said— the Constitution's text and the nation's history both support allowing a state to enforce an elector's pledge to support his party's nominee and the state voter's choice for president. That, of course, uh, comes in the form of monetary fines. In some cases, states have removed these electors. The bottom line, though, good news for voters here, this takes off the table the chance of some big political dra uh, drama, surprises at the Electoral College this, this fall, uh, especially if the election is very close. Diane. All right. And, Devin, the court also handed down a decision today on robocalls. We know they're annoying. Are they illegal? <laughs> They are so annoying. And yes, they are illegal still. The Supreme Court unanimously today upheld federal law that bans robocalls to your cell phones and home phone number. The justices, though, went even further. They ended a special exemption that had allowed government debt collectors to keep using robocalls. Justice Kavanaugh said, look, collecting government debt may be a good thing, but Uncle Sam has to follow the rules like everybody else. Just use a real person or use mail. Diane. All right, Devin Dwyer from Washington for us. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, Dan. And a suspect accused of helping dispose of the body of Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen appeared before a judge today. The appearance comes just a day after the Army confirmed remains found last week were, in fact, Specialist Guillen. Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Today, the suspect accused of helping the killer of Fort Hood Army soldier Vanessa Guillen facing a judge in Texas. 
Cecily Aguilar, charged with conspiracy to tamper with evidence. Authorities alleging she admitted to helping her boyfriend, Aaron Robinson, dismember Guillen's body with a machete-type knife in April. After she says Robinson told her he'd bludgeoned Guillen with a hammer, she did not enter a plea. How this happened at work, at the base, with thousands of people there, I, 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 um, I think this will haunt everyone forever. Tonight, an updated complaint with new disturbing details. Aguilar allegedly telling the FBI she and Robinson went back to where they disposed of Guillen's body to continue the process of breaking down the remains. Aguilar eventually cooperating with investigators, calling Robinson as they listened in. Robinson telling her, baby, they found pieces. The FBI saying Robinson killed himself Wednesday as they closed in on him. And Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, Vanessa's family is such a big reason her story is being told right now. And now there's news about a university lecturer facing some criticism over an online post she made related to this case. What do we know about that? That's right, Diane. Her name is Betsy Scholler. She's actually a retired National Guard colonel as well. And she says she was, quote, giving a voice to the messaging women here when she posted online that sexual harassment is the price of admission for women into the good old boy club. Now, in a statement released by the school, she says that she was shocked and saddened that her post was taken out of context. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us tonight. Stephanie, thanks. When we come back, Jeffrey Epstein's alleged co-conspirator is now in federal custody in New York. But will Ghislaine Maxwell cooperate with investigators? And Prince Harry appearing to take shots at his own family will explain. First, the American location that has faced 9,000 earthquakes since January. Stay with us. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people who just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. The first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7, ABC News, there for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Now to the ongoing crisis in Puerto Rico, which just can't seem to catch a break. The island was still recovering from Hurricane Maria, then facing a barrage of earthquakes, then the pandemic hit. Now they have a water shortage to deal with. We talked with people on the island who increasingly feel their government has abandoned them. For Zori Mendez, this scene is becoming all too familiar. Earthquakes and aftershocks over and over again. Mendez is just one of thousands of people displaced due to more than 9,000 earthquakes that have hit Puerto Rico in the last six months. Forced to live in a tent due to damage to her home, she says she and other victims continue to see more destruction as the ground continues to shake. 
and all live in fear of what happens when the next big one hits. No, no duerme. Porque se ve con la pendencia de que ocurra ese movimiento. Y lo están ocurriendo todos los días. Those fears are made worse by the sense that they've been left to fend for themselves. Aquí desde el 7 de enero, ninguna agencia del gobierno del municipio ha venido a verificar cómo están las cómo está la gente de ellos. Eh, vinieron solamente hace como dos semanas a traer una caja de alimentos y nada más. Era te doy el alimento y nos vamos. O sea, de preguntar, mira cómo estás tú, eh, cómo está tu casa, a orientarnos, este, dónde podemos ir a buscar la ayuda, nada, nada. She says FEMA also denied her help, saying it's her garage that's damaged, not her house, despite the two being attached. Se siente frustrado y no se siente con temor, porque la realidad es que si tú mira, si, si uno mira eso, la gente lo que me dice es que tú estás esperando para irte de tu casa, pero para dónde yo me voy a ir. Si yo pierdo mi casa, yo no voy a tener para construir una casa. O sea, yo no voy a tener para decir, pues mira, yo me levanto. Si yo pierdo mi casa, lo pierdo todo. Viviré toda la vida en una caseta. It's just the latest in a series of disasters that continue to hit the vulnerable island. From the debt crisis to Hurricane Maria to earthquakes and COVID-19, and now a water shortage. Julio comenzó con un racionamiento de agua para muchos sitios. Que entonces la pandemia te dice que tú tienes que tener mucho lavado de, de mano, pero ahora mucha gente en las casas no va a tener agua. Each new crisis piles on the last, making recovery from any of them that much more difficult. Con la pandemia te dicen que no puedes salir de tu casa, pero los terremotos te dicen que tienes que salir de tu casa. Everybody has to get ready. Everybody has to get a gold bag ready. Teacher Marilu Mayorga says it's a phenomenon she's seen over and over again through her nonprofit Island Corps. In early January, she and her team arrived at an earthquake camp ready to provide the kids there with an education, but quickly realized they needed so much more. It was really hard for us to teach there because the children had not showered in four days. Yeah, you were coming to try to teach them lessons on how to spell and do math, and what you found is they needed the absolute basics. Is that right? They needed the basics, yeah, and, and, and also just hygiene, you know, um, we couldn't give them the service because they had, um, they were really soiled, uh, they weren't wearing shoes, it, it was kind of an image, you know, uh, that you see in, in really impoverished nations, and for me it was really shocking. That Rather than give up, Mayorga put out a call for help and her network answered. Within a week, she was back teaching in an earthquake camp, this time equipped with two donated solar showers and donated solar lights. I mean, it sounds like your organization is providing so much more than just an education for these kids and for these families. We had an amazing experience teaching them um, to the point that by our third or fourth class, Every child wanted to go, they could go into the showers. And if I would sing a little song to them about, it's a, about a 30 second song. And uh, so we started teaching them how to wash their hands because in the camps, there was no access to water. And they had lived there, and we needed them to be as clean as possible because we also didn't want to get sick. Still, despite Mayorga's determination, once COVID officially hit the island, Island Corps was forced to suspend their program. I remember the last day that we were teaching and every single student was crying. We can't come anymore, not because we don't want to be here with all of you, but because we can't risk your health. Because Currently, Puerto Rico's health department is reporting over 2,000 confirmed COVID-19 infections and more than 6,500 possible cases. West area of Puerto Rico. Epidemiologist so, Dr. Melissa Marzan says this has been another crisis where the people of Puerto Rico are not response. getting the help they need. So it was very messy at the beginning of the response in terms that we have at least three different um, Secretary of Health over this process through starting the COVID and two different um, territorial epidemiologists. We have so many issues with the surveillance process and how to define the cases. And also we have a lot of complications with the molecular testing here in Puerto Rico because at the beginning of the response, we need to send our tests 
to the CDC in Atlanta. Many have also questioned the government numbers after admitted inaccuracies in April. And while Marzan says the data seems more reliable now, she still worries, saying the island continues to reopen despite a lack of projections on future cases. Is there one thing that you think Puerto Rico needs right now more than anything else? Transparency. We need all the information without these so many layers. We need to have access to the data. We need uh, to enhance those prevention measures at the community level. So that's a, a, a real concern because we are open, opening all these um, activities, but we are very behind in terms of the educational campaign that is very important in terms to make the people take the, all these recommendations. But as the island struggles to cope with the physical ramifications of these crises, they're also taking a mental toll, as evident in a recent mental health survey. The 50% of the participants of that um, surveillance system, they self-report to feel anxious or depressed. Hace un mes y medio, pues mi esposo tuvo que ser ingresado a un hospital de, de salud mental porque su salud emocional Collapse. We already had a really big challenge with the youth here. Um, be, after the hurricane, there was a high level of depression. It's part of the reason Mayorga says getting Puerto Rico's kids back in school is so important, but it's also so difficult. You know, the Department of Education, they want to say, oh, they, we want to start schools this fall, but we're so deep in the trench of the digital divide here. How are we going to teach children when a lot of the teachers, they still don't know how to use Chrome? La mayoría de las personas en las casas no hay computadora, no hay internet. De hecho, este, yo dependía de este teléfono solamente para realizar todos esos trabajos. Era frustrante y yo me preguntaba, ¿y los que no tienen nada? ¿Cómo lo iban a hacer? Some of the schools that we work here, um, they didn't have any soap or toilet paper. And these are things that nobody wants to talk about because everybody wants to paint Puerto Rico as beautiful and we're a beautiful island. But the big issue why we have been the way we have is because of our education system that has failed us terribly. Is there a point in all this where you feel helpless? Mm, I don't feel helpless because I'm always doing something. Her latest initiative, forest schools. We're going to be the first forest school in the entire Caribbean and all of Puerto Rico, our mobile school. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to do education that's outdoors, so small initiatives, of no more than 10 kids. And I think that's the way for us to go. We have to teach outdoors. We're going to need the solar showers. We're going to need lots and lots of teachers and people who care. With all the talent and natural riches Puerto Rico has to offer, she says the island may be facing an uphill battle, but she's filled with hope for its future and hope for change. The new era. Um, People no longer, they do not trust the government here. Nobody does. Everybody feels defrauded by it. And dis disappointed is an understatement. We definitely have to reconstruct, remake, and transform. But pass the torch. It's time to pass the torch. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. And we did reach out to the governor's press office about this report, but received no response. Still ahead here on Prime, the New York woman caught on video calling the police on a black bird watcher has been charged. And we'll take a look at the latest numbers on how the economy might impact the presidential election. First, our tweet of the day. Lead your team to the Super Bowl and get awarded the largest contract in NFL history. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. 
And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. The dozens of people who just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. The first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night, 24-7. ABC News, there for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. We now take a look by the numbers at how our economy might impact the 2020 presidential race. An analysis by 538 found that voters who prioritize the economy tend to skew wealthier, more educated, white or Hispanic, and Republican. In the last three presidential elections, Americans have named the economy as their top concern, according to the American National Election Studies. Early polls for 2020 find that for now, between 20% and 33% of all voters say the economy is their top issue. Wealthier Americans are more likely to say that, with 13% of Americans making more than $100,000 saying they prioritize the economy when casting a ballot in 2016 versus 10% of those in the lowest economic rung. That division was wider in 2008 and 2012. The economy was rated the top issue for 13% of college-educated Americans versus 9% without a college degree in 2016. 12% of white voters rated the economy as their top priority in 2016 versus 6% of black voters who said the same. And still to come here on Prime, professional baseball and basketball struggling to restart after dozens of players have already tested positive for COVID-19. So are the games at risk? And later, it's the return of one of our favorite shows, our conversation with John Quinones. What's in store for the next season of What Would You Do? First, here are some trending stories on abcnews.com. right now this is part of the eye wall this procession of migrants goes back two miles there is going to be catastrophic damage this fire has made a run you can see those flames shooting up into the sky we are on the jam packed red carpet to the right guys so this is the fourth week end of protest <laughs> watch nbc news on location for facebook watch What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you.
thousands headed to beaches across the country to celebrate July 4th. In Diamond Lake, Michigan, hundreds partied without face coverings or social distancing. With a 26% positive infection rate, Miami-Dade now closing restaurants and gyms as officials urge young people to be vigilant. The age that has the most cases in the state of Florida uh, is age 21. 37 states are seeing an increase in cases. Arizona becoming the eighth to surpass 100,000 cases with ICUs at 89% capacity. In Houston, Texas, one hospital reports the ICU capacity is at 98%. This as the country's former epicenter, New York City, makes progress in reopening. The governor warning people to avoid another surge. New York City goes into phase three today. It doesn't mean go out uh, and have a party. It was a violent 4th of July weekend for several cities. In New York City, 48 people were shot on Sunday alone. 10 of them died. Chicago was the epicenter of violence this weekend. 87 people shot, 17 of those fatal, including 7-year-old Natalie Wallace. You hear this on the news every day that a child getting killed, somebody getting every killed, day. but every you don't day. think about it until it's your own. She was playing on the sidewalk during a family 4th of July party. In Atlanta, 8-year-old Sequoria Turner was killed while riding with her mom and a family friend. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. And in Southeast Washington, D.C., 11-year-old Davon McNeil was shot and killed. Amy Cooper, the white woman from New York who called police and falsely accused a black man of threatening her life is facing charges of false reporting. Shut up, Amy. Please, call the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Cooper made the call to police after the man told her to put her dog on a leash. She was with her dog in an area of New York Central Park where leashes are required. Cooper is charged with filing a false report, a misdemeanor. She could face up to a... Amid the Black Lives Matter movement, an apology from Prince Harry, encouraging the UK to reckon with its colonial past and the wrongs that were brought to those countries. And when it comes to sort of institutional and systemic racism, it's there and it stays there because someone somewhere is benefiting from it. We can't deny or ignore the fact that all of us have been brought up and educated to see the world differently. Harry and his wife Meghan Markle spoke at a virtual session of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. The Commonwealth is made up of 54 nations, all formerly under Britain's rule. In that self-reflection, it's acknowledging whatever mistakes we've all made, right? So if we look at the Commonwealth, you also have to look on a more micro level with each of us individually. Country Music Hall of Famer Charlie Daniels has died. He's best known for his 1979 hit, The Devil Went Down to Georgia. Daniels died at a Tennessee hospital after suffering a stroke. He was 83. Welcome back. Ghislaine Maxwell is now behind bars here in New York facing charges of conspiring with Jeffrey Epstein to abuse underage girls. But will she name names? Eva Pilgrim has a report. Ghislaine Maxwell, the alleged partner in crime of accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein, today whisked from New Hampshire to this New York City jail to face charges for allegedly recruiting, grooming, and abusing teenage girls in the 1990s. Maxwell played a critical role in helping Epstein to identify, befriend, and groom minor victims for abuse. The British socialite first appearing in court remotely last week. ABC News has learned she wore an orange jumpsuit and seemed agitated. Epstein accuser Virginia Dufre telling 60 Minutes Australia she hopes Maxwell will implicate others. I really hope she comes forward and says A, B, C, D, E was involved. This is how it ran. You, you know, just, just help us victims get some accountability. The new case does not include Jufre's claims that Maxwell and Epstein trafficked her to Prince Andrew three times, starting when she was 17. Encounters the prince denied in this interview with the BBC. I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. Maxwell's friendship with Prince Andrew dates back decades. This newly surfaced photo from 2002 shows Ghislaine sitting on the throne with actor Kevin Spacey during a tour Andrew reportedly arranged at Buckingham Palace. Prosecutors still want to talk to Prince Andrew but say he's been uncooperative. Prince Andrew should be panicking at the moment uh, because Ghislaine doesn't really care about anyone else but Ghislaine. 
Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that report. NBA teams will begin heading to Orlando tomorrow, but they're already facing some setbacks. The Milwaukee Bucks have shut down their practice facility after receiving COVID test results. In professional hockey, the NHL and the Players Union have reached a tentative agreement to have games in Canada, while some baseball players are now opting out of the shortened season. It's a complicated and messy picture in the world of sports. Our Trevor Alt has more. Overnight, as NBA teams prepare for the start of their season, two teams shutting their practice facilities. The Sacramento Kings and Milwaukee Bucks closing their buildings after members of their staffs tested positive for COVID-19. It's just the latest setback in the world of sports. As Major League Baseball is warming up for the start of the season, there are mounting concerns as to whether the league is ready for the first pitch in the midst of a global pandemic. We want to play. And it's, it's going to come down to how safe we're going to be. With baseball set to begin its season in just a couple of weeks, 31 MLB players from 19 teams have tested positive for COVID-19. While every team returned for training camp on Friday, not everyone is completely confident the league is ready to play ball, including superstar Mike Trout, whose wife is pregnant. Honestly, still don't feel comfortable. Among baseball's new rules, testing for COVID every other day, no high fives, hugs, or fist bumps, and non-playing personnel are required to wear masks in the dugout and bullpen. But for some high-profile players, these measures don't go far enough. The Nationals' Ryan Zimmerman and Cy Young winners David Price and Felix Hernandez already announcing they're sitting out the shortened season, citing health concerns for their families. These are grown men. They have to speak to their own truth how they feel about things. And players in the NBA have also expressed their unease. So far, 25 basketball players have tested positive. Now teams will begin reporting to Orlando on Tuesday, even as Florida has seen a record number of cases. Players and staff from all 22 teams participating will be sequestered in a so-called bubble at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex at the Walt Disney World Resort. League officials hoping that will keep teams safe, but some players are unsure. And Major League Soccer is now two days away from starting back up its matches, though one of them's already been postponed after eight players tested positive. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. When we come back, what would you do? Our conversation with John Quinones on the show's return. We'll be right back. From inside our homes to your home, now is the time. We all just need each other. And that's why we love starting the day together with you. We'll see you in the morning on ABC's Good Morning America. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news. Live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Excuse me, sir. I just had a Confederate flag. My ancestors died fighting that flag. 
it's an insult. If it bothers you, you can just look the other way. Excuse me, sir. Why are you wearing that jacket? What do you think when you see a symbol? Racist. What are things bother me? But I let it go. I wasn't raised that way. I wasn't raised with racism. But how are we supposed to let it go, Kathy? It's every day. We hear it now. That was a look at ABC's What Would You Do, which starts its new season tomorrow night on ABC. The show aims to reveal how people behave in thought-provoking scenarios by using hidden cameras to record their reactions. And the anchor of What Would You Do, John Quinones, is here with me now. John, great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you, Diane. Good to see you. Excited for the new season. So this show is a favorite for so many viewers because you're really able to delve into some timely issues like that scene <laughs> that we just saw over a man wearing a jacket yeah. with the Confederate flag. Now, you filmed that scenario both in Mississippi and in New York. What did you make of mm -hmm. the reactions in both locations? Well, as you might imagine, you know, it, well, in both places, what we were impressed with was that everyone seemed to feel that it was that man wearing that jacket, that Confederate battle flag uh, emblem, uh, that it was his right to, you know, freedom of speech. He, can, he has a right to wear whatever he wants to wear. But we couldn't get away from the fact that in the South, people were more supportive of that man wearing that jacket and told the uh, African-American critic to quiet down. Up north in Brooklyn, New York, people were uh, much more critical of the man wearing the jacket and saying that it stands for so many things that are hurtful in this country. So, you know, geography matters. That's why we film the show in as many places as we can, because um, it, it, there are different reactions in different parts of the country. And it's important to see those perspectives, for sure. I, I mm -hmm. want to take a look at another stage scene where a cashier in a Missouri coffee shop offers some free food to a homeless man, but the manager objects. Let's take a look. Hey, Tommy, here's something warm for you. Oh, thank you, girl. You're welcome. I, I can pay for the coffee. Oh, no, it's on the house. Don't you worry. sure? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Are you giving him free food? It's leftovers. We were just going to get rid of them anyway. We see this group listening in. I just told you I don't like him being here. Bob? She's clearly watching. This is a business. This isn't a charity. You don't just give food away. Here she comes. Here she comes. This woman shows her generosity by giving Tommy some money. No, that's ridiculous. Stop it. There you are. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, John, we saw that bystander react by offering the man some money. The manager tries to give it back. What did some other onlookers do? Any reactions really surprise you here? Well, I want to point out first that we filmed all our scenarios before the pandemic. So that's why you don't see people wearing masks and social distancing. These were all filmed before the, the virus, you know, attacked this country. Um, but the reactions were really heartwarming. She was not the only one. Other people stepped up and offered to buy that homeless man a meal. They criticized the manager because the manager was pretending that she was going to fire that waitress for giving food away. Uh, they criticized her. They pulled her aside and said, you can't fire this woman. She's just doing something that's really, really fine. It was really heartwarming. You know, we watch these scenarios unfold, and sometimes we're in tears behind the scenes uh, because it's so inspiring to see people step up and do the right thing. But it's also heartbreaking, of course, when folks see the racism or they see the bullying and they do nothing about it, or worse, they join in. Um, it reminds us that we have a lot of work to do in this country when it comes to accepting people who are different from us. And John, this is now your 12th year anchoring What Would You Do? <laughs> what do you think still moves you when you're out in the field shooting these scenarios? Well, you know, time and again, um, we certainly within the last couple of years, we see more people willing to speak up. It's as if something's happened over the last couple of years when people have been told, you know, you've got permission to, to, to speak up on issues like politics and race and religion. It's as if there, you know, someone just gave them permission to do that, uh, to resort to their darkest impulses and lash out. Uh, the good news is that in every one of our scenarios, you see uh, the good angels among us, right? The better angels who step in and they save the day, helping a stranger with little acts of kindness. They're, they restore our faith uh, at a time in this world when I think we need it desperately. Yeah, and sometimes those little acts, they do go a long way. John, we appreciate mm -hmm. you being here with us. We look forward to the new season of What Would You Do? Again tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern here on ABC. John, thanks again. 
Of course, thank you. And finally tonight, our image of the day, protesters holding up blank papers during a demonstration in a Hong Kong mall. Some residents in the Chinese territory are finding creative ways to voice dissent after a new law has forbidden political slogans. And that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Stay safe, everyone.